Hanky, welcome to Temp Century. Thanks for joining us on the channel. Thanks for having me. Hanky, uh, we're going to talk about a, a number of different things today, mostly focused around the, the F14 Tomcat and hopefully the Super Hornet at the back end of this. But for viewers at home, I'm hoping that Hanky will come back and we're going to do a dedicated session with Star Baby on Light Attack. So that might be a part two for this interview. But before we continue, Hanky, perhaps it's a good idea for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Awesome, sure. So uh, my name is uh, James Cunningham. Call sign is uh, Hanky. Uh, I joined the Navy out of uh, ROTC back in 2002. Did a 20-year uh, career wrapping up in uh, May of 2022. Had the opportunity to, uh, after flight school, uh, fly the F-14D Tomcat for about three years. Uh, then I transitioned to the Super Hornet. Uh, had the opportunity to go through uh, Top Gun and the Super Hornet. Uh, and become a weapons school instructor. I spent uh, two years as a training officer at uh, NAS Oceana down to uh, War College uh, at the uh, Air Force Command and Staff College. So I, I used to speak fluent Air Force, probably partially fluent uh, since it's been a few years. Uh, did a department head tour and then uh, spent about four and a half years supporting special operations uh, flying the OV-10 Bronco uh, in uh, as part of a combat experiment. Also supported uh, an Air Force light attack effort uh, for a few months, and then also supported uh, an innovation think tank uh, in support of Navy Special Warfare for about two years. I uh, then had the opportunity to come back to the fleet. Uh, there was a, uh, a need for uh, an experienced department head uh, level person, so I went to uh, VFA 211. Uh, again, based out of Oceana, deployed with them uh, in 2019 and 2020, and then wrapped up my career at VFA 106, which is the F-18 Super Hornet Fleet Replacement Squadron uh, in Oceana. And I was the training model manager there where I uh, basically helped facilitate and uh, update the syllabus uh, for the entire F-18 community. And that, uh, that wraps up my Navy career. That's incredible. Um, it's not often I say it, but I'm kind of more interested in finding out about the light attack and the special warfare stuff than <laughs> than, than I am the, the pointy nose stuff. So that's that's telling. But we'll wait. That that will come. Okay, that will come Sounds later. Good. So, um, so so you were when we were talking before we hit record, you were saying that you went straight to the the, the D model Tomcat. I just wondered, can you briefly summarize um, how well prepared you were to do that? So you were you were a Rio in the in the in the Tomcat, um, a radar intercept officer. How how well had Navy is it navigator training um, that pipeline yeah. prepared you to go to the Tomcat? So uh, the training the training was fantastic. So the the designation uh, that I received is uh, it's called an NFO or a Naval Flight Officer. And to give a brief description of that training. Uh, we go through, so when we first get to flight school, we go through a six-week course called API. Uh, it stands for Aviation Pre-Flight Indoctrination. And that is all the prospective pilots, all the prospective uh, naval flight officers, usually classes of about 30 to 40. Um, and, and again, it's just pre-flight indoctrination. So some, some courses, classwork, uh, some parachute training, physiology training. Uh, you have to do a mile swim and flight gear, those kind of things. And then once API is complete, the training track splits where the pilots would go to pilot training at one of several bases uh, in the U.S. And navigators or uh, prospective NFOs will all stay in Pensacola. Um, as you continue through training, you will split off depending on which platform you go to. So the first split is gonna be after your primary flight training where you'll either go uh, maritime, the maritime route. So at the time it was P3s, E6s uh, or large aircraft and then carrier-based aircraft. So everybody else would, uh, would go to carrier-based. At the time uh, there was a track for uh, the E2s, Tomcats. They had just started sending folks to Super Hornets, the S3 Viking and the EA6B Prowler. After the next phase of training, they would split into jets or E2s. And then at the uh, about halfway through your advanced training, you would split into either strike or strike fighter with the strike platforms being 
uh, the S3 Viking or the EA6B Prowler, the Strike Fighters being the Tomcat or the Super Hornet. Um, I gravitated towards uh, the Tomcat partial, well, for, for all the reasons. I mean, uh, you know, everybody was a huge fan, you know, still is of, uh, of Top Gun and just the, you know, the, the, the romanticism, if you will, of the F-14. It just has such an incredible legacy. It's such an incredible platform. And at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of corporate knowledge about the Super Hornet. So all of my strike fighter instructors had been Tomcat uh, pilots or Rios. There were no Super Hornet guys yet in the training pipeline to be instructors. So uh, I'm happy I made the choice. I'm sure we'll talk in, in detail about that. Uh, but the training I received, I thought, prepared me uh, very well to go into the F-14 community. When you are going through this training, are, are you doing um you know sort of radar navigation are you doing astro navigation what what's what's i mean you don't have to tell us the whole syllabus but sure. but, but how but how sort of detailed is that are you, are you at that point so this is this is early 2000s are you starting to use gps as a navigation aid or is that is that a crutch that you're not allowed to use what does it look like no that's a that's a great question we were uh we were right on the uh transition line of going from uh paper charts and navigating without those systems to navigating with them. And I was probably the last of the generation who uh, had to use uh, manual charts. So we would go to the chart room, we would get out uh, straight edges, markers, uh, all the publications, mark up our charts, um, and really more of an analog way of training. Um, we did a lot of, uh, you know, obviously high altitude airborne navigation, and then where it got a little more uh, task intensive and wh what I thought was really good training was the low level navigation. So we would fly a lot of low level routes uh, out of Pensacola, you know, all over the Southeast and without a moving map, without a GPS, uh, having to navigate uh, more of an analog style. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, once we, once we started on the the trainer that we were in where we had an actual radar was the t39 saber liner and it had an old f-16 radar i believe it was an apg oh boy 63 or a 66 uh but we first started in the air to ground mode and we would have to hand draw radar predictions based on our radar training from what was a significant radar reflector whether that's a bridge a road intersection, a power line cut, um, and we would actually do navigation based on air to ground radar, mm. uh, which I found pretty interesting. Once we graduated from that phase, we would use that same radar in the air to air mode to run intercepts, uh, and it was a pulse radar. So very uh, rudimentary, and it took a lot of training, both in the simulator and then in the actual aircraft to be able to uh, predict changes in aircraft target aspect, maneuvers, altitude changes. So really manually running the radar and having that extensive training really helped uh, when I got to the F-14 to understand radar theory and be able to use that radar uh, in the Tomcat, even in a degraded mode, because I had that background. I think it was yeah APG sixty six because the sixty three would have been in the in the F fifteen so okay. that's that's very interesting so so when you were running the um, air to air intercepts in the in the back of the T thirty nine were you all sharing the screen the same screen did you have repeater screens and I mean I'm assuming there were multiple students in there it wasn't just you so there were what we would actually do um, there would be so a contract pilot and then a uh, navigator or NFO instructor in the jump seat. And the student NFO would be in the right seat running the radar. There were two radar repeaters in the back of the aircraft. So other students could watch what was going on, but they weren't actually the one under instruction at the time. Um, during certain flights, depending on you know how many students they needed to get through the training, they would swap students out. So once you did your required number of intercepts, they would swap a student out and another student would go in the, in the front right seat and get their training done. 
We're going to talk, Hanky, uh, at the end or towards the end, um, or whenever it pops up. But uh, but at some point, we'll talk a little bit about the transition from uh, from the Tomcat to the Super Hornet and the Navy's decision around that and how that actually took mm-hmm. place because you were there for it. Um, but I, I wonder, just to preempt that a little, at this point in time, as you're eyeing up the Tomcat as the platform you want to go to, as the, the um, uh, aircraft that you want to go to, are you beginning to hear or see people comment on the Super Hornet? You just said there wasn't much there wasn't much corporate knowledge by the time you got there. That that kind of makes sense. But is mm-hmm. but are you already seeing um, aviators operators start to create uh, a view, or have an opinion about the Super Hornet and whether or not it's a, it's going to be an adequate replacement for the uh, the Tomcat? Sure. So interestingly enough, um, I did not hear a whole lot about it, and I think there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, first, like I mentioned, we did not have any F-18 uh, WIZO or Navigator instructors down there because they just didn't exist, with the exception of the Marine Corps. So the Marine Corps, uh, at the time, they flew the F-18D model, which was a two-seater, and there were a couple of uh, F-18 instructors. However, the the F-18 instructors, they're primary background was all air to surface, close air support. Um, that's primarily what they trained to. So I, I didn't really know much about the Super Hornet. The other interesting thing is that even the pilots that, you know, flew the, the T-34 and also the T-2 Buckeye, um, they weren't sending F-18 pilots there. They were sending Tomcat pilots, S-3 pilots, Prowler pilots. And we actually had some reservists who had been A6 pilots uh, because I believe they retired the last A6 squadron in either 95 or 96. Mm-hmm. So there just wasn't a lot of talk about the F-18 in the NFO training community back in 2002 or 2003. Um, the only comment I can remember when I was speaking with some folks is, is somebody did say to me, they're like, well, you should obviously choose the F-18. You know, that's the brand new toy why would you want to go to the Tomcat? That's 25, 30 year old technology. That was the only person who said you should go F-18s. Everybody else said the Tomcat community is amazing. Um, the Rio's job is extremely important. And, and honestly, we don't know what it's going to be like for F-18 Wizzos moving forward. Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the Tomcat then. I'm going to put you on the spot a bit and ask whether or not you could give us a um, an appraisal of what made the F-14D the F-14D. I mean, I know that uh, as it went through its short service life, the D model had various mm-hmm. capabilities introduced to it, obviously became air-to-ground focused. Um, uh, AMRAM was put on it, but it was never operationalized. So, right. so I know that some of those things happened. But you you talked about how everybody loved Top Gun. Everyone knew the Tomcat from from Top Gun. How would you describe to somebody uh, the differences between the Tomcat that Tom Cruise and Goose was, was flying and the the Tomcat that you stepped into? Sure. Um, so as as everybody I think who goes through naval aviation training realizes very quickly, hopefully before they get there, um, the movie Top Gun is nothing like. Uh, what you experience when you go through the training. It's, it, and I don't want to say there wasn't professionalism in the movie because I think in certain aspects there there were, but you spend a lot of time, you know, studying, understanding uh, the, you know, what it takes to be an aviator, understanding the weapon systems to a very high level of detail, and I think that's something that wasn't really captured as as far as the airplane itself goes. Uh, it was very interesting when I showed up to VF-101, which was the F-18, or sorry, F-14 Fleet Replacement Squadron. Uh, we called it the RAG. It's just a carryover from an older term. Uh, so the F-14 RAG, when I showed up, I didn't really know that there was much of a difference in the A, B, or D, other than the B and the D had bigger motors. And I knew that the D had different avionics than the A and the B. Other than that, I didn't have a whole lot of detail. And again, going back to just not having the information, I wanna say every single one of my flight school Rio instructors 
had flown either the A or B. I don't think we had a single instructor who had been in F-14D Rio and really knew much about it. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got to the RAG, the first day we were there, they broke us out and they said, okay, you're going, you're going A's, you're going B's, you're going D's. And we just got assigned uh, essentially randomly to follow that track. And it was, you know, a different uh, NATOPS, it was different systems. So we would have general classes all together and then we'd be broken out. Uh, and the simulators were in different buildings. So, uh, you know, that was something that I wouldn't have thought uh, ahead of time. Um, do, do, do you, you want me to go into more detail about yeah, D itself? Yeah, if you would. But but can I just first ask before you do that, would you, did you have a feeling as to whether or not you said that you were assigned randomly to the three different varieties or the three different variants? Did you have a feeling as to which one you, you wanted to go to? Um, with, with the little information I had at the time, I wanted to go D's, uh, purely because the, the transition timeline as of December of 2003, when I showed up, had the D's being around the longest. And I knew that if I went to an A or a B squadron, I would get trained in this plane. I might go on a deployment, but within a year to a year and a half, I would have to transition to the Super Hornet. So I wanted mm. as much Tomcat time as possible and being assigned to the D pipeline would, uh, would afford me that opportunity. Okay. So, so you've just said uh, the motors were different. Um, can you describe any, any other differences, um, radar differences, um, anything else? Sure, absolutely. So the, um, the big differences are going to be in the entire avionics suite. So the A and the B, um, they had a similar avionics suite, which was all built around the AUG-9 radar. And I never sat in an F-14 A or B. Um, I never went to one of the simulators because I had so much to learn in the D and I knew I was going D's. Uh, I wanted to focus all my time on that. So um, the D was pretty incredible in the choices they made about what to improve. So um, that system was now centered around the APG-71 radar, which uh, in functionality is, is relatively similar to the AUG-9, I think, in the different modes. Uh, however, it added a lot of new things that they didn't have the time or money to put into the AUG-9. So uh, the APG-71, we had the ability to select medium PRF um, with the radar, which um, I remember Pop talking about this as well, but it gave you, it just gave you more options against maneuvering targets, targets that were beaming, targets that were dragging, and it just gave you more tools in your toolbox uh, from a Rio perspective for how to run that radar. Um, the stores management system was also uh, different uh, and more modern. We were able in in the once I got to the fleet, we were able to integrate um, JDAM into the uh, into the D and a lot of the avionics were just more user friendly compared to the A and the B. So is the aeroplane at the point at which you get to it, which you just said was December 2003. So March 2003, the second Gulf War kicked off. Um, mm -hmm. is, is the aeroplane when you get to it fully, I, I forgive the, if it's a silly question, is, is it sort of fully operational? Are, are they still in the process of designing it, building it out? Um, is it is it ready to go to war at that point in time? Um, how complete an item is it? Oh, it was it was very complete, and and I wouldn't have an exact date on when the D was considered fully operational, but I know that I know that they were flying Ds um, on you know combat patrols, and it was considered fully operational um, in the early to uh, mid nineties. So the D had been around for for a few years. Um, it did go through some more uh, maturing and getting more capability, uh, both while I was in the RAG and then uh, when I got to the fleet. So the uh, the lantern targeting pod was uh, something that was incorporated on it, which was an incredible uh, electro-optical sensor, uh, an in or, uh, infrared sensor uh, that we were able to deploy with and use. We were able to integrate that, you know, with laser guided weapons, with JDAM, uh, which was, which was really tremendous. 
Um, and then there were some other things that we integrated on deployment uh, to include Rover or basically a video downlink for um, troops on the ground to be able to see what we were seeing on the lantern. Hey everybody, sorry to interrupt your viewing, but if you'd like to support the channel, please do visit 10percenttrue.com and take a look at my store. You can buy polo shirts, t-shirts, um, stickers, patches, and uh, even my books. And speaking of which, if you're listening to the podcast, this won't make sense, but if you're watching it, then great. The one that's being played in the background at the moment is my new book, F-15E Strike Eagle, Be Afraid of the Dark, Part One. It's a glorious coffee table book, been professionally laid out and put together. It tells the story of the Strike Eagle from 1984 to 2002. I'm taking pre-orders for it now. If you're interested in it, if you're thinking well, it might make a nice present for somebody, please do go ahead, visit 10percentdrew.com place an order thank you okay so another question that might 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 mm -hmm. sound stupid um at this point then is the um you know the reason for being the raison d'etre for the f14d to provide CAS? have have are you still the fleet defender as is that mission taking up 50 percent of your mind you know or, or your training or your you know your consideration or is it is, it, is that resigned to to history so by that point, the writing was on the wall that that mission was resigned to history. Um, while we still did air-to-air uh, -air training, right after I, uh, I'd probably been in the RAG for about three or four months, we got the word that the Navy was decommissioning the AIM-54 Phoenix. So I'd, I'd had a month or two of training. I think we had just gone through our familiarization, all of our NATOP stuff. And right about when we were going to start learning the weapon systems and how to employ air-to-air -air missiles, they said, hey, we're, we're not funding the AIM-54 any longer. So the only air-to-air -air weapons that we had were going to be uh, the AIM-7 Mike and the AIM-9 Mike, which even back then were not comparable to uh, threat weapons. So it was pretty much at that point that the F-18s who did have AMRAM, they were the primary air-to-air -air players. Now, the Tomcat would still stand in alert with uh, AIM-7 and AIM-9, but from a pure capability perspective, the F-18 by 2004 had taken over the role of air defense. Were you doing any BFM uh, in your training then, or, or when you got to the fleet, was, was, was BFM something you continued to do? Yes, so there was a there was a full BFM as well as an air to air syllabus that we trained to in the RAG, and we still train to air to air, just no longer with the Phoenix. Um, you know, we were basically Sparrow and Nine Mike only. Um, still did a, a good bit of BFM training. Obviously, BFM is a little more um, of a pilot focused mission, just because they're the ones fighting the jet. However, I think you could you know I think most Tomcat pilots would argue that a good Rio who could assess threat nose position, um, you know, make sure the radar is working so that the pilot could use uh, BFM radar modes and just provide general overall essay uh, was was still pretty valuable. Okay. I, I, I was considering um, I was asking about whether or not, I think Puck, when, so you referenced Puck already, that if anybody mm -hmm. who's listening is not familiar with the Parker, I, he's a, an F-14 pilot who I did an interview with a year or two ago. I'll put a link in the description or up above so you can go and look at that. But he was talking about some of the cheats that would be uh, used in order to get the airplane to max perform. And I just mm -hmm. wondered whether or not um, at the point at which you got there, you know, that stuff was all once again being sort of consigned to history as, as something they used to do. But now there's no point in even trying it because that's not the mission of the airplane anymore. I was just sort of curious to know whether culturally that was still a done thing. So, so it definitely was um, because it's still, you know, BFM, just like, you know, other missions, even if it won't translate directly to a combat skill, um, the pilots are getting, you know, the more BFM they do, the more familiar they're getting with the aircraft. The more a Rio does BFM, the more familiar he's getting with threat, no threat nose positions, um, being able to, you know, perform, maintain sight, operate systems under G's and and we all knew we were going to the F-18 at some point. Mm -hmm. So so having those skills uh was still trained to. Um some of the the cheats or hacks that that I saw 
these were reserved for uh, senior pilots. So uh, the guys that I went through the rag with, they never really had an opportunity to do this. But um, and, and I might be repeating some of what Puck said, but um, the F-14, the, the two hacks that I would speak to, the one is uh, the variable wing sweep. So if you were fighting an F-18, per se, and you were able to manually uh, put the wings back, if you did that manually, you could be at any airspeed probably above 300 knots, still maintain control of the aircraft. However, a non-savvy F-18 pilot, if he came to the merge with a Tomcat that had its wings completely swept back, when they're in the auto mode, they're only going to go the whole way back, approaching 450, 500 knots. So that pilot will assess, I'm coming to the merge with an aircraft going 450 to 500, and I'm going to execute my best BFM game plan based on that. However, if the wings were manually swept back and you come to the merge with 300 knots, that F-14 is going to do stuff that the F-18 pilot wasn't expecting. And if he gets a bite uh, at that first merge and really throws that F-18 pilot off, that Tomcat's probably going to win that fight. Um, so, so that was one uh, interesting hack I saw. The other one was uh, putting the flaps down when you were in a slow speed fight. Um, I'm sure Puck talked about that. I, I, I didn't have the chance to watch that far into the video, but uh, I saw a couple individuals who could slow speed fight the Tomcat better than than I could even imagine. Um, there was one specific case where we were doing a 2v2 against um, some, some F-16 pilots and uh, the Tomcats just wiped the floor of them. And, and one of the things that helped was, you know, putting the flaps down in a slow speed fight. Can can you describe then? You've already said that BFM is a pilot's game, and you you can help with being an extra set of eyes and helping to assess you know what the threat is doing that kind of stuff. I'm always really interested to to hear about the the ebbs and flows in the dynamics between front seater and back seater. And, you know, in the Air Force, uh, there are very clearly camps. You know, there are mm -hmm. the the single seat guys who will die single seat. You know, fight fight and die single seat, and sure. they'll never want anybody in in the trunk. Um, there are other guys who say, no, you know, if, if you think that way, then you just haven't got it right. And that extra pair of eyes, the extra brain, you know, the extra, uh, you know, sort of um, manager of the weapon system of the battle space while you're flying the airplane, that stuff is, you know, makes a massive difference. It's a game changer. So, mm -hmm. um, and you can see when you talk to people from different eras that the, the, the dynamics between front and back seat change. And you talk to a striker guy who flew in the 90s and they'll say well i ran the radar the backseater ran the radar up till the merge talk to mm -hmm. a strike eagle crew now and they'll say no the the pilot runs the radar the whole time um from mm -hmm. you know all the way out until until uh, until the merge um what were you seeing as a young guy then in terms of i mean the the f-14 was designed as a crewed airplane that's right that is, that is how it was built that was how it was intended what, what were you seeing in terms of um the relationships between front seaters and back seaters and then just because I like to ask lots of questions in one go and then stop talking. Mm -hmm. um, what was your role? Were you expected to keep quiet? Um, were you expected to talk a lot if you're in the backseat? Are you supposed to give the guy some advice and say you slow speed up? Or, you know, you know, uh, and, and, and how do you how do you internalize what you have to do? Because I guess if, if it all goes wrong and you get shot down, then you're going to die too, so. A absolutely. Um I, w I wish I could give you a, a very clear cut answer. Uh, I'll give you the most top gun sounding answer possible, which, which is it depends. Um, and I think what made a good Rio was, was being able to adapt to one, the pilot you were flying with two the, the situation that you were in that day. Um, I'll start off answering your question, leveraging our BFM discussion a little bit. And I think that'll probably lead to some more, hopefully, insights that I can provide. Um, one of the things I think I learned early on and, and was taught to us is that, one, we were a crew. And the Tomcat was designed, it, it made it pretty easy. There was stuff in the front seat that I had no control over. There was stuff in the back seat that the pilot had no control over. So you had to know those systems 
because you were the only one who could operate those systems. That was a little more clear cut than it was in the F-18 community uh, when I got there. Back to the BFM topic, um, the way I always saw it was that the human brain can only process and then react to so much information at any given time. And what I tried to do as a Rio and BFM was work with my pilot to see what was falling out of his scan so that I could say one or two things that he could react to without having to have a whole lot of processing capability. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when we would uh, when we would set up for uh, most likely a defensive BFM perch set where um, the you're you're basically setting up so that the attacking aircraft is 40 to 50 degrees off your tail you start either a left or right turn to set that up and what you're training to is you know you're in combat you look out and you see that you're in a threat envelope and you need to you know defeat any initial employment and and at least neutralize if not get an offensive advantage well when you're setting up for that both the pilot and the Rio are looking out, you know, over their left shoulder in a turn. It's then going to be under G. Well, the pilot is not looking through the HUD. He's looking outside and something's going to fall out of his scan. It could be it's not a level break turn. It could be he gets slow on his airspeed. Well, what I could do is I could momentarily peek inside, take a look at the airspeed and then just say something that was effective, such as uh, 10 knots slow or 20 knots slow or level your turn. So he could make some minor adjustments while still maintaining sight of that aircraft and not have to come inside and, and look through his HUD or down at his instrument panel to see that. Uh, same thing uh, throughout any sort of engagement where if he loses sight, uh, he can tell me, hey, I lost him. And I can just say, you know, right five o'clock, 10 high, or more applicably, um, break right. He's at our five o'clock, 10 high. So being directive over descriptive, um, but having that good working relationship where I can tell something to the pilot, he will, you know, he has his trust in me, he will move the jet and then we'll, we'll sort it out afterward. So, um, that was how I saw that relationship working. And I think also the more you understood about BFM, the more a Rio understood BFM concepts, the better Rio uh, you could be to help your pilot out. Were you at, at, at any point during your um, time flying, well, I suppose the Super Hornet or the, or the Tomcat, were mm -hmm. you hard crewed? I mean, did you get to a point where you kind of would be in sync, in inverted commas, with the person in front and you would, kind of know what they were thinking yes very much so um what we would try to do is when we started um a certain workup phase to the maximum extent possible we would try to keep uh a pilot in rio crewed up so that they could go through that phase of training together uh now if you were just flying a jet from uh you know oceana to fallon maybe you didn't necessarily need to be with that person but when you were doing tactical training by being crewed up with the same person, you got to know uh, just those things uh, that I previously mentioned, like, you know, hey, this always falls out of their scan or, mm -hmm. hey, I know they're really good at this, so I don't need to worry uh, as much about that. And just developing that working relationship uh, made you a much more lethal crew. Well, one question I wanted to ask you about then, and, and I think it relates to this, is, is the going to the boat piece and in mm -hmm. the back of the tomcat you've got no control of the, what the airplane is going to sure. do no throttle or stick or anything like that um and 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 how you sort of or did you become comfortable being in the back of an airplane that was landing on the boat sometimes perhaps in you know at night or poor weather or rough sea type conditions and what um you know what are you thinking as you as you enter you come into the groove you know, the, the quarter of a mile, call the ball, whole thing, you know, that everyone mm -hmm. knows from Top Gun uh, as somebody in the back who's really just a passenger. Sure. Um, so the way I thought about operating around the boat, and, and again, we get all the training on the procedures and 
you know, how to operate the boat. And I think one thing that is very hard to translate to somebody who's not been in the community is the only things they ever see are the plat cam footage or the last, uh, the last 20 seconds of that flight. There's a lot that leads up to it. There is a lot of coordination with the ship, with uh, the ship controllers to get you to that point uh, where that last 20 seconds is what matters so much. So my mindset around the boat was, I wanna do everything I possibly can so that the only thing the pilot has to worry about is getting to a good start and flying a good pass. Um, now, the Tomcat, depending on who you flew with, there would be certain uh, calls that they would like to hear. A, a pretty common one was what their vertical uh, speed was or their VSI. Because uh, one thing that um, maybe lagged a little bit, or, or again, just a piece of information that those pilots like to hear was, hey, they didn't need to hear, hey, the ball's a ball low or a ball high. They can see that. Um, they also have an LSO or landing signal officer who's going to tell them, hey, you're lined up left, you're lined up right, get back to center line. However, if they were to get behind on the power, one of the first indications of that, along with the LSO, you know, hearing the engine spool down or seeing the aircraft uh, start to drop, is the vertical speed indicator would, well, decrease. Um, and if you saw that, the pilot could react to that a little bit more immediately than he would if he saw the ball start to come down. For example, um, you're looking for somewhere, we'll just call it, you know, a 700 foot per minute rate of descent. If all of a sudden you're flying along and, it, you know, 700, 700, 900, 1100 foot per minute rate of descent, the pilot hearing that 900, 1100 is going to allow him to get on the power maybe a little bit sooner than, oh, he just saw the ball drop or he just got a screaming power call from the landing signal officer. So again, just providing one more piece of data for that pilot uh, to help him fly his best pass. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That last uh, 20 seconds, that's really a pilot LSO relationship. However, I think if you ask most pilots, um, a good Rio worrying about everything else, worrying about all the communication calls, setting up the navigation, uh, getting all the systems in the back correct, um, that that was instrumental in flying the F-14 around the ship. Mm. Was there a lot of uh, variability within the pilot community and in terms of um, sort of skill level? I know it sounds like a funny question to ask, but I'm always reminded of that joke, of, you know, what do you call the guy who graduated bottom from his uh, medical class, um, doctor. Sure. You know, he's, right. he's still a doctor, but he was the worst guy in the class or she was the worst girl in the class, whatever. So I, I wondered, you know, you hear about, you know, occasionally you hear about guys who get it, get to the boat and then they end up getting sent back home, even though they're carrier qualified, because mm -hmm. for whatever reason, they just can't do it in, in an operational environment. Did you see that? Um, were you Were there people that you would rather not fly with or there were people who you felt more comfortable with? I would say there was definitely people I felt more comfortable with. Um, but what I would tie it most to was just experience level. Um, I thought that the I thought that naval aviation did a very good job of making sure that the right people made it to the right place. So if you were able to carry or qualify in the F-14 in the RAG, then you were going to be able to fly around the boat in the fleet. Now, again, there's always situations where that wasn't the case, but I'd say from a from just a perspective of, hey, we're doing the best training we can, Naval Aviation and the, the community did a really good job of that. So my only real comparison to, oh, you know, some pilots were better than others was really just based on experience. The more experience you got, the better you got. Let's talk maybe a, a bit then, um, Hanky, about the the combat side of things and the the mm -hmm. mission of the airplane. Uh, the the sure. question I, I would like to ask you about the the Tomcat, some, the D model is sometimes called, I think, the Bombcat. 
Um, mm-hmm. uh, what, what was your assessment of it then? You, of course, went to the Super Hornet and you talked about how you went and, and flew the, well, you, you've mentioned that you went and flew the Bronco. And again, we'll hopefully come back to that in a separate episode. But mm-hmm. um, what, was your, what was your assessment of it as a platform then for the mission that it was being asked to do in the time you were flying it, which would have been sure. yeah, just um, after the, the first Gulf, second World Gulf, Gulf War? Sure. Yep. And and that's where we went to support. So we were supporting, um, you know, missions in Iraq in 2005 and 2006. So not the initial uh, kickoff that there was in 2003, but, you know, a lot of counterinsurgency ops, like there was still a lot of combat operations being flown. Uh, the Tomcat, the D specifically, the improvements that had been made, the integration decisions that had been made, I think, in the late 90s, really proved effective so that we could provide weapons uh, that the ground force commander wanted. Um, the weapons that we carried on our deployment were the uh, the GBU-38, the 500-pound JDAM, as well as the GBU-12. Um, the plane uh, had a flight clearance for all the 500-pound variants, uh, or sorry, all the variants of your uh, laser-guided bombs, so 500-pounder, 1,000, 2,000, as well as we had a flight clearance for the 2,000 pound JDAM. And then we were able to get one for the 500 pound JDAM for our last deployment. Um, and that was just due to the demand signal coming from uh, the theater at the time. So they didn't really need 2,000 pound bombs. They needed multiple 500 pound bombs. And the only real disadvantage that we had is we couldn't carry more of them. Uh, we just didn't have a flight clearance to carry, you know, four JDAM and four GBU-12s like a Strike Eagle might. Um, but for what we were doing, having the weapon variety of the laser guided versus the GPS guided, and then obviously to include uh, the 20 millimeter cannon, um, those were good weapons to carry. I just wish we had more of them. What about range and loiter time? How did that um compared to other platforms at Theater? Sure. Uh, the range and loiter time of the Tomcat was was better than the Hornets that we were flying off of the carrier with as well. So um, the Hornets would either require, you know, well, really more tanker support or just uh, shorter missions. So the Tomcat uh, had the legs to get to certain places that we needed to have coverage at uh, during that time frame. I think looking at the the Air Force side of things, it'd be interesting to hear you talk about the Navy side of things, but the Air Force side of things, traditionally CAS was a mission that was flown by specific units with um, mm-hmm. you know um, airframes that were really designed for it. The A-10 is an obvious example of that, sure. and you know, the CSAR as well for the A-10. And then through the 2000s when um, it, uh, things in Afghanistan picked up and Iraq picked up, the uh, Air Force as a whole t- started taking on the CAS mission and you then right. have what would have been seen as non-specialists providing CAS. And and I know that at that time, you know, there was a little bit of uh, anxiety around the idea that you'd have somebody who wasn't a CAS specialist providing CAS. Did you see the same in the Navy? Did they up until that point have dedicated CAS units? Um, and and is, is CAS a, a difficult mission to learn? It's obviously high stakes because you're dropping bombs in close proximity to friendlies. Um, but what... Um, you know, what is the importance of the mission and how did you, you know, how did you train for it? Sure. So um, as part of our our strike or our air to ground syllabus uh, in the RAG, we had a, a decent number of cast flights and we spent a lot of classroom time learning cast procedures. And the same thing was taking place in the F-18 RAG at that time. So uh, once you got to an air wing and you integrated with everybody, cast was an extremely important mission. When we went to Fallon for our air wing training, we executed a lot of CAS. Um, And one big difference in the Tomcat community compared to the Hornet community is that um, I I don't know the story very well. I've only heard it, you know, third, fourth hand. Uh, But in the mid 90s, the Navy was asked to assess whether the F-14 could provide the forward air control airborne or FAC-A mission. And by the time I got there, they were making uh, forward air controllers in the F-14. And what that for what that FAC A syllabus did is it was almost like a graduate program in close air support. 
So the, the prospective FAC A's went and got a JTAC qualification. They spent four to six weeks working with uh, the Marines or special forces going through that qualification process to become a JTAC. And then another extensive nine flight syllabus to become a FAC A. So by having FAC A's in the squadron, you, your squadron became sort of the de facto CAS experts. So uh, F-18 guys could do CAS, uh, you know, as well. But I think having two, two heads in the cockpit, in the Tomcat specifically, a dedicated sensor operator or the Rio running the lantern pod and the pilot being able to fly the appropriate orbit, set up the appropriate timing for a delivery, uh, back up the Rio and making sure that all the weapons were set up correctly. Um, I would argue that a two, a, a well-trained, proficient two-seat crew is a better cast player than you know a less proficient single-seat crew, uh, even though on paper both aircraft can do the mission. Can you give us some detail, Hanky, then, around the the avionics suite and what you have in front of you in order to help execute that mission. You talked about Lantern already. I think you got Lantern 40K, didn't you? So it could operate above the 25,000 mm -hmm. foot limit that the the Strike Eagle had. Um, right. I, I, I don't want to be drawing comparisons with other platforms all the time, but at that point in time, you know, Strike Eagle and, and the F-16, I think actually the uh, Alabama Air National Guard was the guy, were the guys that got this first, but they had the Lightning II pod and then mm -hmm. they were getting the Sniper pod, which were you know, generationally improved over Lantern. Right. Uh, but you described it as a good system. Um, and of course, you had in the D model a, um, a big screen, didn't you? Uh, with, I don't know if we it did. had a high pixel count or, or it was magnified or whatever it was. But can you talk mm -hmm. about what, what tools you had and, and what your office looked like and how you used it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the displays that we had, so yeah, you mentioned, so, and I'm probably going to be moving around a little bit as I'm visualizing the cockpit. Um, but yeah, so the 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 centerpiece was going to be um, our PTID. So it was a probably eight by eight by eleven or maybe eight by twelve. It was it was a good size uh, screen. Uh, it wasn't full color, but it it didn't need to be. Um, and when we were operating in the uh, air to air mode, it was essentially our radar display. Now we had a we had another radar display above that, uh, which was the raw radar, but then the mission computers would process it, put it on our PTID for uh, all of our tactical information. Well, there was a button um, that if we were using the lantern, we would just push the button and now that became our lantern display. And have it being right in front of you, having it you know, being large with, with good um, resolution, both on the, the display and the pod, really helped us quite a bit in being able to detect targets, track vehicles, or really maybe see things that may not be apparent on another uh, aircraft. So uh, that was, you know, the lantern hand control, which was on the left side of the, the aft cockpit, and the PTID with the lantern video was sort of the centerpiece of our display. Now on the on the left side, we're gonna have uh, one, uh, one DDI, which we could select all the different menus. And that display was the most similar to what I then saw in the F-18, where now you had multiple DDIs and, and you could put different things up in different spots. Um, in the air to ground mission, we primarily would have the stores management system up. And that's where we're gonna select the appropriate weapon, select the right fusing, um, the right uh, thin, set up if we were dropping uh, unguided weapons, either free fall or uh, in uh, in the retard mode, um, we would have that display set up for our stores management set. And then on the right side of the cockpit is where we had what was called a DEU or a digital entry unit. And the best way I can describe how it works is it is you are texting with a early 2000s flip phone. So um, if we were going to send a Link 16 message, uh, I didn't have a, a keyboard or anything like that. I was no kidding, bringing up a menu and I was hitting, you know, two once for A, quick two taps for B. You would wait for the 
the pixels to go to the next one. Um, so very similar to that. Um, and the majority, you know, all the data entry that we did for close air support uh, was all going to be off of that uh, DEU or data entry unit. So even to this day, I can picture it and I can picture, you know, how do we enter it quickly, but how do we also make sure we're doing it accurately? Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time uh, using that DEU. Um, a few other systems we had, uh, let's see. So we had an ALE 47, which was our uh, dispenser unit. And that thing was great. Um, it was more modern than what most F-18 squadrons were flying with, the ALE 39. So for countermeasures, we were able to carry flares and chaff with the regular buckets that would be underneath the fuselage. Um, but we were also able to carry what was called a bowl chaff or bowl IR, which were little, um, they were little playing card packet, uh, playing card pack sized packets that could fit into the rails of where we put the, the nine mics on. Station, you know, I think it was 8A, or sorry, 1A and 8B, if I remember right. Uh, but I think we could put up to like 180 of those packets into the rail. And they were designed so when you ejected one, it would hit the horizontal uh, stab uh -huh. and then just have a massive bloom of either chaff or uh, IR you know, flare countermeasures. Um, and that ALE 47 was all uh, programmed and run uh, from the rear cockpit. The pilot could uh, dispense them, but we had to be the ones to set it up, troubleshoot it, uh, and all those kinds of things. So those were the those were the main systems. Well, and then of course the radios, uh, you know, encrypted radios, uh, we set all those up. Um, so those were the that was like the main combat suite that uh, that I can recall. Did you have a satellite communications capability? No, unfortunately, uh, we did not. And we we didn't in the F-18 for my entire career as well. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier Rover. Um, that, again, was mm -hmm. something I think the um, Alabama Air National Guard debuted in, in combat. Mm -hmm. um, what what was the introduction of the of Rover to the, the Super Hornet? Like, um, sorry, I keep saying the Super Hornet there the Tomcat like, and, and, and what, sure. what did the system represent to you? What, what did it look like? What sort of interface did you have? How did it work? Sure, absolutely. And first, I'll apologize for the grandfather clock going off in the background. <laughs> I hope it's not too distracting. Um, it's, it's very sophisticated. Yes, yes. My wife, uh, my wife loves grandfather clocks. Um, so the, the story behind the rover is probably one of my favorite stories about the Tomcat. And not only what innovation, it, but it's just one of these cases of people communicating and coming up with a very simple yet effective solution. Um, and the way this all went down, and we, so so both Tomcat squadrons, um, VF-31 and VF-213, we worked together with the folks back uh, stateside. So we were on deployment and we start getting requests from the ground forces hey, we would like to be able to have this rover capability. So we start digging into it, and it turns out that it's really just a very small blade antenna that is transmitting this video to a ground receiver. At the time, it didn't need to be encrypted, and we didn't need to be uh, frequency agile with how it was transmitted. So we got the requirements, we talked to the engineers back in the US, and I remember they still had a few Tomcats at Oceana and somebody sent us a video of some folks from the test community in Pax River. They came down, they had a laptop, they put, they cut a small hole in the Phoenix fairing um, in the, uh, the tunnel in the Tomcat, put this very small blade antenna on and connected it directly to the lantern pod video output. And they flipped a switch and it just worked. Wow. So that was the testing that was done because it was such a small cut that had to be made. The decision was made, hey, this doesn't affect the flight characteristics. We don't need to put it through flight test. I want to say from the idea being discussed to us having the rover team in, you know, they flew out, they installed uh, the rover system on all 22 Tomcats. I want to say it was under six weeks where we really? went from 
initial idea to being able to fly with it uh, in combat. Mm -hmm. And again, just an incredible capability that you brought to integrating with ground forces. Now, in the years that have progressed, you know, we now need to be able to transmit Rover on multiple different bands. It needs to be encrypted. As the enemy has gotten more sophisticated, we've needed to get more sophisticated. So, so that idea would not work in 2022, but in 2005, it, it really saved the day. So uh, incredible capability and incredible just story of innovation and folks working together to bring that capability to, to the fleet and protect our, our guys on the ground. So the idea is that you're beaming back down to somebody on the ground, your Correct. Um, target pop video, so they get a bird's eye view of what it is they're seeing on the ground. Does it work the other yes. way? Can you also, can they can they transmit to you? Would there be any utility in them being able to do that? So uh, in, in this specific case, it was just a, a one-way transmission. And from, from my training in air-to-surface missions, there is there's a ton of utility in the the guys on the ground being able to see our perspective from the air there's not as much utility as us being able to see what they're seeing um so the way we have since trained to it and how they train jtacs uh and, and i was able to to go through that training um as well just a little later in my career is being able to have the right conversations with the guys on the ground um, about what they're seeing versus what we're seeing. The rover capability just brought to them, oh, wow, this is totally different. And now instead of just talking about getting on the same page, they can see what we're seeing, hmm. translate that into what their situation is, and then tell us, hey, move your pod left, move your pod right, move it north, move it south. That is your target. Or, you know, hey, move your pod over here, so you can see where the friendlies are, uh, just takes a lot of work out. Mm -hmm. um, and and CAS can be very time critical. So so any time savings is uh, very valuable. Again, hopefully not a stupid question, but 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 was there any thought or do you think it would be useful if, um, I don't know why I'm asking this, but if, mm -hmm. if, uh, if the guy on the ground um, could control the pod, so you're in your little orbit. I mean, would you sure. would, would you be able to give them, is, would it be practical to ever give them control of the pods? And they don't have to tell you where to put it. They just drag it onto the point and, you know, designate it. Or sure. So I think, I think there could be some utility. This would be a case, though, where I don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze. Um, and, and I only say that because if that were to then become the way that we train, well, what happens if that capability doesn't work? What if that, um, what if the the line of crypto that we needed for the the ground controller to be able to control the pod wasn't working that day, but that was all the guy had trained to? Mm -hmm. um, I think being able to, to move it in the cockpit and work the communication with the guy on the ground is effective. Now, the conversation is probably gonna change a little bit if you're now talking about an unmanned platform. Mm -hmm. So if it were a uh, UAS, now I think that conversation may may change. Um, and maybe this is just the old guy in me, but uh, you know, I'd rather have the, the, the JTAC tell me where to move my pod than to start moving it uh, on my own. Just yeah. like when I got to the Super Hornet and a pilot would start moving my AT FLIR, I said, hey man, this is, this is my sensor, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> So okay. I, I think as Rios and, and Wizos, we might get a little selfish with uh, who's running that sensor. <laughs> tell, tell us a bit about your combat deployment in Hanky. Are there a, what, what are the standout missions for you? What, what you know, all these years later, um, 22 or whatever it is years later, what, what, are you, what are your, well, not quite that many, but it'd be 18, 19 years later, what, what, are you, what are the missions that still sort of stay in your mind or the emotions that stay in your mind? Sure. Um, so the, the one thing I learned on my first combat deployment, I think this, this can translate to, to, to just about anything is, um, when it comes to that is it, it can be hours of sheer boredom interrupted by moments of pure chaos and being able to transition from, Hey, everything is nice and quiet to, 
hey, we need to be uh, Johnny on the spot right now because lives are on the line um, is something you had to be prepared for. And um, now my first few combat missions, I was on edge the entire time. Um, you want to make sure that you're executing the right procedures. There's a lot of administrative things that are involved with it. You have to take off on time. You have to have all your systems working. Then you have to find your tanker. The tanker has to have the right amount of gas. Then you have to get to this point and check in with this person at the right time, place, altitude. You have to deconflict from all these other folks. Um, so the, admin the administrative side of the flights initially um, was overwhelming. Now, any sort of working with the guys on the ground, we had trained to that. So, so we could do that. We could follow convoys. We could, um, you know, we could scan routes for, for threats, things like that. Um, and then it shifted a little bit, the more combat flights you got where the administrative stuff became routine. We also went to the same places a lot because the Tomcat could only get to certain places from the ship. Um, so we found ourselves going there quite a bit and to the point where, you know, I could probably draw, uh, I could probably draw a map of Mosul, Iraq. If you gave me, uh, you know, a couple of crayons to this day from the amount of time that we spent there, the, the, the locations, the, all the, all the different, um, significant things that we saw or, or knew where to go. You got very proficient operating um, in that environment. So I think to understand the kind of combat we were doing, you need to, it's worth at least mentioning all the administrative stuff that was going into it. I mean, these are seven, seven and a half hour missions that we were doing, you know, three, four times a week uh, for every crew. Um, so, so that is definitely part of it. Um, some of the missions that stand out uh, for me, uh, there was one where, um, our section was re-rolled from what our plan was to, uh, support some guys in a, in a town way out in Eastern Iraq that we, you know, we didn't have maps for all we really had was a call sign and a frequency. And we were told we needed to get there as fast as possible. So we, so we did, we executed a show of force, uh, because this team was essentially got ambushed in a town in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we execute the show of force. They're able to get out of the town. And then we provided um, we provided cover and route uh, route scanning <clears throat> the entire way for them to get back to a friendly location. So um, that's one mission that really stands out for me. Um, other missions, which which I was not on, but that were, you know, guys in my squadron did. Um, it was really the cases of hey, we thought we were going to go do one thing, and then all of a sudden you get the call, hey, you're the closest aircraft, or because you're Tomcats, you can get there really fast. Um, we're going to send you guys there. You have very little information, and you are very quickly going to be expected to locate the friendlies, understand where the threats are coming from, and help them neutralize the threats as quickly as possible. So uh, the guys who were able to execute those missions um, – the, that really stands out. And, and even to this day, you'll hear stories 10, 15 years later of somebody being at a conference or somebody being at the, you know, the Fallon officers club and someone will say, oh, wait, you were on that deployment. Oh, hey, did you, you know, I remember Hellcat 2-3, man, he really saved a day. Oh, well, that was me or that was my buddy. Um, you know, and just uh, really the stories of being able to protect uh, the guys on the ground when things went sideways. That's, that's what really stood out for me uh, on that deployment. And, you know, honestly, a lot of subsequent deployments as well. What, what did the show of force look like then? So um, on paper, and I think I can probably say this because I'm retired, um, <laughs> you know, on paper, we had very specific instructions, uh, special instructions or spins that would dictate um, you know, what altitude, what airspeed you needed to be at for a show of force. It was less restrictive uh, back in 2005, 2006. And we we considered it, you know, hey, we're in a small arms uh, man pad envelope if we're doing a show of force. So the best thing to do 
is um, to be fast and to be low. So we got low and we got fast. And, you know, the Tomcat could definitely scare somebody. Uh, so, so making sure that we were executing the show of force on the appropriate run-in access that would access that would be most beneficial to the friendlies so that the enemy knew we were there. And then also, if we were going to execute another one, to make sure we didn't come from the same direction. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so, so we would be as low and fast as we thought made sense, depending on the situation. Um, and then also depending on um, what the ground force commander requested, or if there was an elevated threat posture, depending on the area we were in, we would also dispense uh, flares just to defeat any sort of, you know, infrared guided uh, man pad. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that and how prevalent was that threat? You, it was really interesting to hear you talk about the bowl system um, mm -hmm. hitting the stab to disperse the um, countermeasure. I was kind of thinking, I'd, would you really want something that's on fire hitting hitting the stab? Um, but but um, but what was the threat, and, and how did how did you how did, how did you anticipate it would play out? Sure. Um, so so the nice thing about the uh, the Tomcat stabs is they were they were tough. Um, the fact that they designed something to hit it and then give you that signature was pretty cool. Uh, I'm pretty sure if something hits a Super Hornet stab, it's a mishap. Uh, <laughs> you know because. Uh, those materials are, you know, you're going to get a chip in it or something. Uh, so yeah, the Tomcat was a tough aircraft. Um, as far as, so, so your question was about the threat, yeah, um, perceived you, threat at the time. Were you expecting, I mean, were you thinking these guys just have old SA7s that probably don't work or were you thinking they've got SA14s, SA16s, they've got sure. the best, they, you know, we, we are genuinely in peril when we're down below 8,000 feet or whatever it is. Right. Um, you know, how serious was it? How serious? I mean, I'm sure you took it very seriously, but, you know. Britain yeah, so, terms. no, so, so great question. At, at the time, we, uh, as one should, I think you, you take it um, more seriously because um, what if our intel was wrong and, you know, we'll use Missoula as an example. What if there was just this wide proliferation or you know, a shipment of SA-16s got smuggled in that nobody knew about. Um, we would not want to be the test bed for that. Mm -hmm. um, so trained to the highest perceived threat, there was no need for us to loiter low and slow. It didn't, it didn't really provide any benefit. So we just adopted that mindset of, hey, if you're going to go low, you better be fast and you better be low. Um, in that off chance that there was some threat that we didn't know about. Um, in reality, I think there was probably, you know, SA7s around, but um, again, real, real tough to hit a Tomcat low altitude with an SA7. Hmm. So. Did you find, um, and again, it's not, uh, it's not supposed to be a, a, a stupid question, but did you find this type of warfare enthralling did you find it satisfying um you know you you kind of think of sort of going in and flying you know threading the needle flying between uh, into an iads and you know dropping bombs in that kind of conventional warfare type thing that's what you think of when you think of warfare i suppose air warfare less so the uh, sort of asymmetric warfare of, of fighting against people that are dug into an urban environment and maybe look like civilian population and now you've got to be really careful and drop one little bomb here and you know, mm -hmm. whatever. I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to um, belittle it. I, I'm just genuinely sure. curious as whether or not you thought, yeah, that's, that's cool, man. I'm pumped up, I'm pumped for this. And this is, this is exactly what I hoped I'd be doing when I joined the Navy. So, so I don't think, I, I'm pretty sure if you talk to every person who ever joined the Navy or, or any service, it's never what you think it's going to be. Um, and at the time, yes, it was, it was exciting. I mean, I was on my first com uh, my first combat deployment. Um, you know, I, I had been wanting to do this ever since I was in high school. So you're fat, you know, you're, you're looking at six, seven years of preparation to include, you know, college, flight school, training on the Tomcat, doing a deploy or workups for the Tomcat and now being deployed on an aircraft carrier, supporting troops on the ground. 
it was seven years of, of preparation that had led to that. You know, that's what I was there to do. Um, also leveraging the experience of the guys who, who had more experience than I did. The, the battle, you know, the, the combat that we were seeing was different than the last deployment they had done. Um, so being able to adapt and really provide the best support to not only the guys on the ground, but what, what the mission was, it, it was absolutely exciting. Um, I will say that, you know, kind of like those administrative things got easier over time. Um, if you were going to the same place, doing the same thing every single day, and there wasn't really a whole lot of action going on, it can get a little bit mundane. Um, but the mindset that I always tried to keep was, well, it's mundane right now. Mm. In 10 seconds, we could get the call saying, we just located a high value target and we need you to have a GBU-12 on that building um, in the next 10 minutes. Mm. So there, in my mind, there was always something in the back of my mind that said, don't get complacent. We need to be ready. So that raises yeah. an interesting well, hopefully question. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. It does. Yeah. I mean, I just, I suppose that you just, you, you have, uh, if you're sort of a, a child of the Cold War, you think of air warfare as, you know, fight your way into the target, bag a MiG, drop a bomb on something, right. you know, dodge a few SAMs and then come back. And that's your, you know, that's what it looks like rather than go and loiter for, like, as you described for a long time. And then suddenly a small, intense period of action, um, which is very proportional. Uh, and then and then right. back again. So, um, but it does it does raise the the question in my mind then about weaponeering. So, if you if you're turning up, you've got a tasking, you know what you're supposed to be doing. But then someone calls and says, "Hey, your tasking has just changed. You're now going to go and do this." Mm -hmm. um, do you have in your mind, or even as a you know written down on your lineup card in the airplane, a set of weaponeering criteria for dropping things like a GBU-12 into a building? Um, I know that around that time, the Air Force was using concrete filled. Uh, GBU thirty mm -hmm. eights, so that the, you know they were not explosive. Were you right. were you looking at sort of urban warfare and becoming really um, an expert practitioner in how to to weaponeer in that environment? So to the point where you could do it off top of your head in the jet as you sort of well, race sure. your way towards a target. Yeah, abs absolutely. So um, the first thing that um, we needed to keep in mind is is we have some very specific numbers um, related to collateral damage or or even more specifically, when you are uh, executing a close air support mission, um, we just call them danger close numbers. So if friendly forces were to be inside of a certain range from that weapon, then there was a the chance that they could be incapacitated. And obviously, if you were off target in their direction, that could be even more pronounced. So we had some hard and fast numbers that were in reference to danger close. Um, and through our close air support procedures, we would need to make sure that we had that conversation with the ground force commander if, in fact, we were dropping in close, pro you know, very close proximity inside that danger close threshold uh, to those friendlies. However, when it came to uh, weaponeering in general with what we were doing, we had three weapons available to us um, on the F-14 at the time. So we had the GB-38. We had the GBU-12, and then we had our 20-millimeter uh, cannon. So what would then give us a few more options is the fusing uh, option. So with both the GBU-38 and the GBU-12, we could drop either with an instantaneous fuse or a delay fuse. That delay fuse um, is going to give you uh, more of a penetrative capability before that bomb detonates and we would balance a couple of things there. We would balance, well, what is the target? If it's a hardened building, then I'm you know, leaning toward using a delay function. Also, using that delay function is going to make your danger close or your collateral damage number smaller. So we would factor in a couple things. It's a building in a city. Uh, it's not going to move because it's a building, right? Um, the friendlies are close, but maybe not too close. We would have the conversation with the JTAC, recommend delay fusing against this target. You know, so you take a couple of those factors and you think about it. 
So sounds good. We'll, we'll choose delay fusing for this. Now the situation changes a little bit, let's say. The target is actually personnel on top of that building who are shooting at friendly forces. And those friendly forces are 100 meters away. So we're inside danger close, but a delay fuse weapon isn't necessarily going to destroy the target. You know, we need the fragmentation effects of that instantaneous fusing to neutralize the threat. So in that case, again, all other things being equal, I would have the conversation with the JTAC, say, hey, if you guys are able to get cover, get cover. This is danger close. I need approval from you to do this, but I want to use instantaneous fusing because I think that has the best chances of solving your problem, which is the guys shooting you on the roof. Um, then if you factor in, okay, well, what if it's a vehicle? Well, the vehicle might not be moving right now, but it could move. Now I'm going to pick, say, maybe a GBU-12 where I can update uh, with a laser spot where that vehicle is. Um, and then fusing considerations go, go in there as well. Um, I can miss a little bit with instantaneous fusing. I can't miss as much with delay fusing. So probably a little bit longer of an answer than you were looking for, but all things that that we would factor into all of our decision making when we're engaging targets in support of uh, friendly forces. There's no such thing as too long an answer on this channel. You okay, can, you can, and that's fantastic. Really, I don't think we've had anybody, you know, describe the um, the matrix for how you would go and do that on the fly. So that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, how many how many deployments? How many combat deployments did you do then in in total, including the Super Hornet? Uh, let's see, uh, four. four, so four, four total deployments. So, so the question I wanted to ask that was sort of tied to that then is that knowledge that you develop, those skills that you develop in doing that, um, were they carried through over time, um, to all the other units in the Navy? One thing that I observe with, um, the Air Force and, and other Air Forces around the world is that that kind of knowledge is sometimes lost and then, you know, guys and girls have to go out and they kind of relearn it. And, and you think, well, why didn't you just go and talk to those guys who did it 10 years before because you're doing the same thing and they didn't and the, mm -hmm. and the knowledge wasn't carried forward. Did you have a, a a culture of learning, of knowledge management within the Navy that meant that as you did, the, as you did your second, third and fourth, you were really sort of drawing back on codified knowledge that you had built in your first deployment? Absolutely. Um, one of the amazing things about naval aviation and, and just why I'm, I'm so glad I was a part of it is I think a culture of learning is instilled from, from day one. Um, we, we would, uh, even on that first deployment, based on lessons learned, we would adapt and you would have the conversations with the right people at the right level of, you know, hey, this weapon, this weapon to target pairing isn't working out so great. We haven't had some good results. What are what are some other ideas on what we can do? Um, and again, those conversations would need to happen probably at a little higher level if you're going to change what weapons you're carrying or what tactics you're going to you're going to use. But it could go down to um, you know squadron level stuff where, hey, we need to have better procedures for loading our crypto into into our weapons or into our radios because half of the times we launch we don't have the right crypto um those those problems can be solved at the lower levels and having that culture of learning means that everybody can talk about it and it's not you know like maybe some other organizations where hey these are the published procedures and you know, we're going to be more mad at you if you don't follow the, the procedures instead of if you find a way to get it to work. Mm -hmm. um, my experience in naval aviation has been get it to work. And if we need to change the procedures, we'll change the procedures. Um, but, you know, we put that mission accomplishment or, or getting it to work from, from the lowest thing of, hey, we're now 100% with good crypto the whole way up to, hey, we need a new weapon to counter the latest threat. Mm. Um, and obviously there's some lag time and we definitely don't want to have a conversation about acquisition bureaucracy. Um, 
but the Navy is definitely a learning organization, naval aviation very much so. Um, and I, I would say the younger generation, um, it's easier for them to to reach out. You know, we live in a day and age now where information is much more much more ubiquitous, and um, being able to reach out to the right people, there's there's just a much broader network than maybe 15, 20 years ago where, hey, one air wing may, may have been doing really great and they just weren't talking to this other air wing because um, email was down or comms were down or something like that. So we're, we're, we're good. We can always be better, but we're definitely moving in the right direction with that. When did you find out, Hanky, then, that you would be going to the Super Hornet? So I knew uh, that I would eventually transition, um, you know, even when I was in flight school, the Tomcat, um, the sunset at that time had been planned for um, 2007, I believe is when the last Tomcat squadron was going to transition. While I was in the RAG, um, the Navy made some decisions and they moved that transition up by about a year, year and a half. Um, it probably worked out better for me in the long run. Um, because had I, had I not had the squadron not transitioned until the end of 2007, that would have been the end of my first tour. And I wouldn't have been guaranteed the ability to transition based on the next set of orders I got. Mm -hmm. So having been in a fleet squadron, when the squadron transitioned, which for us was, uh, we started in April of 2006, I was right about the halfway mark on my JO tour. And um, I had enough time to learn the Super Hornet before I, you know, was looking at my next set of orders. Um, so I knew for a while, uh, but that that date did slide up. Can you give us um, an overview then as to, you know, what you saw in the Super Hornet and where you saw it being strong um, and inverted commas weak against the Tomcat. I mean, one thing I, mm -hmm. I observed personally is I, I was at Oceana and I think about 2008, I don't remember exactly when it was, 2007 maybe, I got to fly in the back of a Super Hornet. I was very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, but, but when I talked to the guys, they were all ex-Tomcat uh, pilots and, and uh, Wizzos. Um, mm -hmm. And they were all a bit morose. They were all a bit, down in the dumps and i said to them you know well, what, what's you know what, what do you think about moving to the super Hornet? isn't it a cool jet and they're like no we want to we would rather stay with the tomcat so hmm. so there was very evidently a school of thought that said that the navy had made a decision that was not uh, popular let's say no, that's sure not, not, not let's not go as far as say it was the wrong decision that would be controversial we tried to avoid controversy on, on this channel but mm -hmm. um what were you seeing what what was your take on tomcat versus uh so f14d or super mm -hmm. the the proposed super tomcat versus super hornet. Yeah. So this is a case where um I'm glad that we were not the first tomcat squadron to transition. Um we were the second to last. And go going back to being a culture of learning, uh we were able to learn what mistakes were made by some of the squadrons that transitioned before us. And I wouldn't even really call them mistakes. It was just um, culture differences between the Hornet and the Tomcat community, um, where some of the guys who were initially transitioning were, um, and again, I wasn't there, so this is this is uh, my disclaimer for <laughs> I didn't experience this. Some of the things I'd heard was certain F-18 instructors treated combat experienced Tomcat guys like new guys, like right out of the right out of the rag or, you know, right out of flight training. They're like, no guys, like, you know, we're, we're a fleet squadron, you know, yes, we're learning this new plane, but we also have a lot of experience and we, we are probably more peers than, than less so. Um, so I think that drove some tension for some of the, the early squadrons to transition. Um, by the time, and, and it also came from from leadership. So there was certain, you know, whether it was commanding officers, whether it was department heads, if they went into that transition with a bad attitude, then there was going to be more tension. And I will give a lot of credit to my commanding officer at the time when we transitioned. Um, he loved the Tomcat more than anybody. 
And when we were on our way back from deployment, uh, he sat us all down and, and to paraphrase, he had a conversation. He said, we are going to embrace this uh, 100%. He's like, I love the Tomcat more than anybody. And I will celebrate the Tomcat. But the day that we get rid of, our, you know, the day that we uh, send away our last Tomcat and the day that we show up at VFA 106 to, to transition to the Super Hornet, we are now a Super Hornet squadron. And his leadership uh, made our transition smoother. As with anything, it wasn't perfect, but he set the tone and he, and he said, hey guys, <laughs> If we go in there with a bad attitude, and and again, I don't want to disparage anybody else. Everybody's experience was different, but there were some, you know, patches that would go around where uh, a Tomcat squadron would make their their new F eighteen guy wear a Tomcat patch that said zero point zero hours, or, um, you know, there were certain patches that were you know Tomcats by, uh, you know, Tomcats by choice. Hornets by mandate and, and just guys who just fought it. And depending on how that was received and depending on how guys acted, uh, it didn't, it didn't move the needle forward for naval aviation. So, uh, I guess to summarize all that from a purely cultural perspective, I'm really glad we had the leadership that we did where it was, Hey, we can love our heritage. We can love the Tomcat, but we have to embrace the super hornet and and i think that made us uh better and that and, and again that's from a cultural standpoint um i'd be more than happy to talk about some of the technical stuff uh that i saw as well but i but i think that'll help kind of set the mindset um that we had moving forward i, I definitely want to explore the technical stuff with you but can i can i ask you one question before we do that though oh sure it's very interesting to hear you say that those hornet guys the super hornet guys treated the tomcat guys like they were you know newbies um i hear that a lot i mean i, I interviewed a guy called bones ledsham he's a, a canadian hornet pilot he went and did an exchange mm -hmm. with the royal air force and he's the tornado f3 guys there treated him like he was some kind of amateur he had more hours than most of them right um you know you you, you uh, i talked to you know um a guy uh, who, who'd flown a marine hornet exchange and he his name is tug wilson and he, he got there and the air force f15 guys talked to him like he was an amateur he had more hours than them and he was better than them where do you think that comes from? Where where does the right to treat somebody in that way come from? Is that uh, an ego thing? Is that machismo? What is it? So my personal opinion is that's probably how those guys were treated when they were new. Um, and and it and it won't be everybody. I guarantee that it was probably just a couple of guys who, who made somebody feel that way. And, you know, I'm sure I've done that in my career at some point where, you know, I may have belittled someone or we called them new guy or, or, or things like that. But I think the older I've gotten, the more I realized, um, having the attitude of just embracing someone or, or, or recognizing their experience, um, you know, let their actions do the talking. And, you know, I would hope that after, uh, the guy who'd been, uh, you know, in the Canadian Air Force after he'd flown with them a couple times, they're like, oh, OK, he he knows what he's doing. Um, but it, it's probably a little bit of that machismo. It's probably also um, how some of those instructors were treated with when they were students. Um, and, and some of it, I think, is good because you can have a new guy who shows up and he thinks he knows everything. And that's not what you want. Um, I, you know, that's, that's more of the new guy conversation, but, uh, yeah, we, by the time we transitioned from the Tomcat to the super Hornet, we did not really feel that way when we went through the transition. Um, so, so they made progress on it. We really felt like it was, uh, a very collaborative process for us going through. And I honestly think more learning occurred. Uh, because we didn't have some of those tensions early on. Give us a technical breakdown then. I think um, you sure. know one thing I'm really curious about um, is Puck mentioned the Erst on the D model and said mm -hmm. 196 miles, I think he said, seeing a bunch of S-16s behind a tanker on the Erst. Um, 
no worst on on the Super Hornet, but obviously it later got the ASO radar. Uh, can mm-hmm. you, yeah, tell us tell us as much as you as you're allowed to about uh, how the two compare sure. capabilities wise? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so from a from a technical perspective, the excuse me the the APG seventy nine leaps and bounds uh, beyond what the APG seventy one was, and you know. I think if if I were to summarize uh, my, my career, uh, it, it would be the bumper sticker would be right place at the right time. I've been a really lucky guy because our squadron was the first squadron on the East Coast to to transition to Super Hornets with an APG seventy nine radar. Mm-hmm. So everybody else had transitioned with an APG seventy three, which is mechanically scanned, still very capable. Um, but we were going right to the 79. And because all of our jets were at VFA 106, I, with the exception of maybe some familiarization flights, all of my tactical flights were done in an APG 79 aircraft. Um, so I had a really unique perspective going from a, a Tomcat with a 71 to a Super Hornet with a 79. Um, the radar is incredible. So from a radar perspective, uh, that was gr- that was a, a, a tremendous improvement in technology. Um, when it comes to our you know primary air to ground sensor, initially the lantern I preferred over the um, I preferred over the AT FLIR, and there were there were still some older pods being flown by F 18s to you know to include the Nighthawk, the T FLIR. We saw the AT FLIR mostly, however. Um, I, I thought that there could have been a lot of better ways it was it was mapped from how you how you manipulated the sensor to um, what options were available. I felt the lantern was more capable um, initially. I think the AT Flare has improved over time. They've added a lot of things into it that it, that have made it better. But at the time, I think the lantern was superior to the um, to the Super Hornet. Another interesting aspect, was, which very rarely gets talked about, is mission planning. So um, the Super Hornet, you know, we we went from we had one mission planning computer for our entire squadron, and the only thing we really needed to load on it was our JDM information. Um, you could load waypoints and you could do some other stuff, but that was all stuff that you could put in the jet. So if you were just going on a ferry mission you didn't need to, to load a brick uh, to, to put into the mission computer. The Super Hornet has to have one. And you have to, you know, a lot of pre-mission planning. Um, and as the squadron's mission planning officer, um, I learned very quickly how critical that aspect is to the entire plane functioning properly. So the Tomcat, you became a troubleshooting expert. Um, if you couldn't get something working, most likely because it you it's because you weren't trying hard enough or <laughs> um you you needed to do something in a, in a different order so you could take a tomcat and you could get the best out of it that it was going to give that day a super hornet if something's not working it's not going to work and you know that's a little bit of a a summary of that there there's obviously some troubleshooting that can go on but not nearly like in the Tomcat. So um, from a combat systems perspective, Super Hornet, hey, it either worked or it didn't. Whereas a Tomcat, like you could get something out of it. Um, I mean, same thing with the with the APG-79. If you have one line of code in your mission planning wrong, you either have to go, get a new mission card or that radar is not going to work that day. Um, not the case with the F-14. You know, I can cycle transmitter circuit breakers. I can cycle receiver circuit breakers. I can do all sorts of different stuff to try and get something out of it. So um, some very, very good capable things that came with the Super Hornet. Um, but if you're, you know, a meat and potatoes guy like me, um, having a Tomcat, uh, being able to troubleshoot was great. Um, one one very brief vignette, I'll, I'll say, one of our first um, air to ground missions, we were going out to drop bombs. In the Super Hornet, when we're going through the RAG, um, we took off and we had some problem with the stores management system. And my first inclination was 
to cycle circuit breakers. Well, in the Super Hornet, there are zero circuit breakers in the rear cockpit, and there are seven circuit breakers in the front seat, none of which you should be cycling while you're flying. <laughs> All the other circuit breakers are in external panels that can only be accessed by maintenance crews on the ground. If I'd been in a Tomcat, I would have cycled the three SMS breakers and I can still tell you exactly where they are because I cycled them all the time. And we would have a working stores management system. We landed from that flight, explained to the, the maintenance crew what's going on. They open up the side panel, cycled the breaker, system worked. But we mm -hmm. lost a sortie because we couldn't cycle those systems. It's just a different design. Um, but I, I think that's something for a listener to, you know, they, I think they'd be interested in that, that, uh, you know, the engineers at a different place had a different mindset than the, than, you know, the engineers at Grumman, maybe, uh, 50 years ago now. Do, um, do you, I mean, that's an interesting question because people often cite when they, when they're, the debate rages on about whether or not the Super Hornet, um, should have replaced the super or should have been picked instead of the super Tomcat proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that people often talk about is mission capable rate. The Tomcat, I remember I interviewed Jim Robb um, and he said that on, he was on the first tour of the Tomcat that, at sea and he said they broke all the time. They, they were fl flying most of the time without working radar. He said it was just yep. a, a shambles initially. And, and then when I talked to Puck, he said, you know, you guys are lucky in the D model community because the others have been retired so he had all the spare parts all the expertise the corporate yes. knowledge the maintainers have been held on to so you had very high mission capable rates but it was a little bit um misleading let's say because that's not how really it, it operated in in the the span of its career the tomcat sure but but do do you think that um it's a valid thing to say well you know the tomcat had mission capable low mission capable rates generally um, and then, mm -hmm. you know, you need a newer airplane to be reliable and, and to be able to go out and fly the mission when it needs to, to, to be flown. No, I, I absolutely do think that's the case. And I, and I, and I would argue that, um, the super Hornet from a mission capable rate is definitely, um, definitely better than the Tomcat was. We absolutely saw in the Tomcat community, um, it, it was the, the parts availability. You know, it wasn't that our maintainers didn't know how to fix something. It wasn't, um, it keeps breaking. It was, there were just not enough parts to go around. Um, and, and Puck's right. We were absolutely lucky because every F-14 part that we needed was available to us on that last combat deployment because there was no other F-14s being flown back stateside. Um, so yeah, I would absolutely say from a, from a mission capable rate across the board, Super Hornet um, is better, but I do still think there are some lessons learned that can be applied from the Tomcat community or maybe even in future aircraft design. Um, one real quick comparison, if you will, is um, so in a, in a Super Hornet, if, if your strobe light isn't working, um, or, or let's, let's say it's a wingtip light and you identify that well, if it's a night mission, hey, you you can't take off with without having the proper light configuration. You're probably not taking off. They can do a little bit of troubleshooting, but it's probably going to be to replace the entire assembly. In the Tomcat, I remember being, you know, approaching the catapult on the ship. And the final checkers are say, say oh, hey, we have this one light that's not working. We had one of our aviation electricians go up loosen a panel, splice a 28 volt DC wire from something he knew was working to that light, wrap it up, you know, wow. stitch the plane up and, and we went. Um, so again, I'm sure he, you know, did that all in accordance with what he needed to do. Um, but that just wouldn't happen on some more modern aircraft. Hmm. Um, you know, some of these more analog systems, something like the Tomcat, you know, you could get it working, you know, and I, and I think when you're talking about new aircraft designs, everything else, they really need to have the maintenance folks involved in that conversation. Um, because if, if a box, if, if the procedure is to swap a box and the, and you find out that the box 
doesn't have the reliability rate that was advertised and we didn't order enough boxes initially, you now have a major problem on your hands with a billion dollar program, hmm. you know, and you're not really able to fix it at the squadron maintenance level. It's, it's, it's a, it's a higher, you know, it's a more elevated problem at a different, you know, maybe a depot level uh, issue. So. What about, uh, Hanky, the, the Earth then? Obviously, you, you've talked about the APG-79, which, as you've already you've just said, and other accounts you know, sort of are, are allied with yours in saying that it's an amazing radar, the ace capabilities, and, and people describe it as being magic. Um, mm-hmm. but, but that Earth, is that something you would have wanted to have seen? on the Super Hornet. I mean, you, I, it's really interesting to hear you say you went through Top Gun. You, you, uh, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know that. Otherwise, I would have had some questions ready for it. But, sure. but uh, you know, when, when you think about um, the interception mission, mission, you think about the air-to-air mission in general, um, is an Earth something that really is a game changer? Does it add an, another dimension, another tool to your toolbox to allow you to go and, and execute the mission? It, it absolutely does. And... Um, at least in the situation that we were in, um, we did not need the Erst in 2005, 2006 on that deployment to accomplish our mission. We used it though. Um, I mean, we absolutely used it to to find tankers at long ranges, uh, to use it just as another tool in the toolbox uh, if your radar wasn't working or it wasn't working optimally that day. Um, so I was very surprised when we transitioned and uh, back around this time, Erst was just kind of a drawing board idea for the Super Hornet. Um, I was surprised by that. So um, I, I know the Erst, they, they, they have some Ersts in some squadrons right now in the F-18 community. Uh, I have not talked to those guys about them, and, and I'd probably shy away from it just for, for classification um, issues. Uh, having said that, though, I think there was an opportunity for naval aviation to maybe have learned a little more from how we employed the erst um and applied that to the the acquisition process uh that they did with the super hornet do you think that was a navy thing you don't think that was boeing um which obviously is the manufacturer boeing going and doing their thing without with with a with an idea in their mind that that they didn't need to to develop an Erst, or do you think somebody? I'm asking you to speculate, so you can just say no. I'm sure. not going to speculate. But but do you think there were are there, are there are there people in the upper echelons of the Navy who, in the same way as in the 50s, people said there are never going to be dogfights again? There are people now in the upper echelons of the Navy who say we don't need Erst because we've got Acer, or Acer's coming, and we therefore don't need to go on. Right. Oh, oh I, I absolutely think I, I think that was the case. I think it was. Um, I, I'm sure it was a combination of the manufacturer the the requirement um because the f-18 didn't have an erst mm. you know the the legacy f-18 um so i i think one of the things that people just always need to have in the back of their mind when they're looking at these programs is the super hornet was really an improved version of the f-18 it wasn't hey we're going to recreate a new aircraft um and i think when you look at who manufactures it who is uh, who are the decision makers for the requirements? When you combine all of those things, you will probably miss some things that that could come back to bite you in the future. Um, and I think Erst is a good good example of that. Um, at least from a perspective of, hey, maybe we could have had Erst in two thousand seven as opposed to you know twenty you know later than that. Final question for you, Hanky, because well, I need to wrap up. But um, sure, it was on the Top Gun piece. Uh, you described earlier through the, the, the our discussions around BFM about how you know sort of that is a the pilot's domain with you providing some some backup and some support mm-hmm. in various ways. I wondered what becoming um, uh, what going to Top Gun and graduating as a student wizzo means. Then, mm-hmm. where are you in, on that? Uh, in, in that endeavor, what do you spend your time on? And what, you know, people talk about the, the final weapons school or the weapons instructor courses, it's now called in the US Air Force being the PhD level equivalent of air warfare. Is it the same mm-hmm. for Top Gun? And, and, and what, you know, what, what did you come out of that experience as versus what you went into it as, as in terms of your skills and, and aptitude? Oh, sure. Um, 
So, so going through Top Gun, I I can say is is hands down uh, one of the most rewarding uh, career experiences of, of my life. So, having the opportunity to to attend was, um, you know, very you know I, I was very excited about that, uh, and it was just an incredible opportunity. I went through um, with with you know I was crewed up for the entire time with the same pilot. Um, his call sign was Metro. I'll give him a shout out. Uh, fantastic pilot. Um, him and I had been in the same fleet squadron together. So we knew each other very well. We were able to do a workup with our squadron before we went out. Um, and we really had just a crew concept the entire time we went through and we would help each other with, you know, our briefs, our debriefs. We were, we were critical of each other because we wanted to, uh, we wanted to, you know, do our best. And obviously we wanted to graduate. Um, <laughs> You know, um, so 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 making sure we're able to do that. It's also the the only time I've had in my Navy career where you are 100 percent focused on being the best you can possibly be. Um, the days are long, but and, and they hold you to a very high standard, but you have access to the best instructors, the best adversary uh, pilots the best facilities um, that, that the Navy has to offer. And, and again, it was just such an incredible opportunity. So fortunate uh, that I that I was able to be a part of it. And what it then translates to is, um, you know, allowing you to be the best uh, instructor you can be. Because once you graduate, I, for me, I went to the uh, Strike Fighter Weapons School at Oceana to be an instructor there uh, when I graduated from Top Gun. So they just instill the mindset that, you know, hey, the buck stops with you as the instructor. You you are a graduate. You have to set the standard for the fleet um, and not only know the material, but be a good teacher. And because if you can't teach it to the next generation, then, then what what's the point? Mm -hmm. um, so really just a, a lot of great life lessons as well as, you know, allowing you to be at the, I mean, the best I ever was in an aircraft was my graduation flight in Top Gun. Uh, you know, because we had flown every day. We'd been held to a very high standard. You're extremely proficient. Um, and uh, and again, just an incredible opportunity. So ho hopefully that that answers your question with Top Gun. I, I always say to people, it's my last question, and I think of another question. But, so the, but this uh -huh. is genuinely no my, my last question. But, but before I ask it, I'm just going to say, um, I, I, if if you do come back, and I hope you will, to talk about light light attack, and maybe we will do it with Star Baby, and um, you can talk about OV ten um, at the beginning of that. We we do mm -hmm. need to find out what what is behind your call sign, but that wasn't the question. Um, it's just a primer, <laughs> so that so you are yeah. you know I'm going to ask you next time. My uh, ending on a very light note, but I think topical is: should Tom Cruise do a a Top Gun three? Ooh, I, I'll tell you, I. I was very impressed with with Top Gun Two. Um, I also know, you know, I'm I, I'm very close friends with with some of the folks who advised on that movie, and we had some we had some great conversations after the movie. They came, movie came out saying, "Hey, did you see that? Hey, did you see that?" Um, and it was great. I uh, I don't know. I don't know if you can top the first two. So okay. that was that was a non-answer. Well, uh, I suppose it was kind of an answer. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I would say no. Uh, no I, I don't okay. know what they're. I don't know what they're going to do to to top the last one. Yeah, okay. There's some memes going so, around. Apparently, he's apparently they're talking about doing a top down three. So, oh, I, I believe it. I, I I really do, and believe it came out in May of 22. If I'm yeah. correct. Yeah, I think I went and saw that about a week before my actual retirement. Really? So, uh, yeah, talk about a lot of a lot of emotions seeing that movie. Um. But yeah, I thought it was really well done. I don't know if they can top it with a third. It would have to be F thirty five if they if they bring out a third. And no self respecting Wizzo or Rio is going to want to see an F thirty five. Prob probably not. And I don't know how they'll find another Tomcat to to bring back. <laughs> <laughs>
Iran. They've got loads of them. Um, right, right. right. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been a treat having you on the channel. I've really enjoyed yeah, hearing really enjoyed um, it. the backseat story of the, the Tomcat sunset, sunsetting. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to, I really, really am looking forward to hearing about the Bronco side of things and your experience on the, the light attack side of the business too. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.